and uh, all sorts of topics along those lines. You can definitely check out his website uh, and YouTube channel, the Think Institute. I think that's what it is. Uh, he'll correct me in just a few moments. Uh, just a couple of updates. I have some really exciting guests coming up in the in the far. It's in like in the far future, but I get so excited that I share it on my uh, on my social media uh, anyway because I'm just excited about sharing it. But uh, I have a couple of, uh, of of cool guests coming up in December, all the way out in December. I have Pastor Jeff Durbin of the Apologia Church. Um, and folks who are familiar with presuppositional apologetics and the ministry of uh, Dr. James White, um, of course, you will most definitely be familiar with Pastor Jeff Durbin. So I'll be having uh, Jeff here in December. Uh, also, hmm, let's see here. I will also have Mark Farn. I think it's Farnham or Farnham, something like that. Uh, he's the author of Every Believer Confident. Um, and it is a it is an awesome introductory um, book on presuppositional apologetics. And so people always ask me, how can I learn presuppositional apologetics in a very simple uh, and straightforward uh, way? Um, this book, Every Believer Confident, is an excellent book for, uh, for that. And so I'm happy to have uh, Mark on there. That's going to be on um, August 25th. Also, to be announced, I don't have a specific date, but I'll be having Brian Auten from Apologetics 315 back on uh, the show. Uh, we're going to be talking about apologetics and movies. That's going to be a lot of fun. And I was invited, along with a bunch of other apologists, to uh, hop on Matt Slick's channel um, at karm.org. Uh, Matt Slick is uh, the president of karm.org, Christian Apologetics Research Ministry. Great website, very large website, lots of articles, a lot of information to sink your teeth in if you're wanting to learn apologetics. But I've been invited to jump on there with a bunch of other apologists. I'm not sure. I think Anthony Rogers will be there, uh, Dr. Tony Costa, um, and a few others. I'm not sure exactly which ones, but Matt's a friend of mine. And so when he asked me, I was like, awesome. So I'll be doing that on August 23rd. And I think, I think that's it for now. Ah, okay. Wait a second. So no date now. Okay. But in September, I have um, locked in, um, at least uh, he's confirmed that he's going to come on. We need to lock a date in. I'm going to be having Dr. Lane Tipton of Westminster Theological Seminary uh, to come on to talk about his new book on Van Til, uh, Van Til and his Trinitarian theology. So we're going to be talking about presuppositionalism, Van Til, and uh, Van Til's views on the Trinity and things like that. So that's going to be super awesome once I get the date locked in there. Um, I will let folks know. Uh, just real quick, I just want to fill people in on my health. Uh, now, I had a kind of a scare on Friday. Sunday was my wife and I's 12-year anniversary. And so we went to celebrate on Friday. We went out to dinner, and I all of a sudden became very lightheaded. Um, and I started shaking. Uh, I literally felt like I was going to die. And they actually had to remove me from the... Um, the restaurant and my and put me in my in my van and my wife was gonna uh, take me home uh, but I said you know what I want to be safe I've never felt this thing before please take me to the hospital and so uh, my wife took me to the hospital I started uh, shaking and feeling uh, woozy I felt like I was gonna uh, pass out um, and they gave me fluids and and all sorts of things it was a mess it was terrible um, and then the next day well they sent me home that same night the next day. Um, everything started out well. I went to take my son to uh, get a haircut, and on our way out of the of the barber shop, I began to feel lightheaded again and shaky again. So I had to sit down in a store near the area, and they had to call the paramedics. And so, uh, thankfully, uh, all of my vitals were perfectly fine. Um, the um, I guess the symptoms that I was uh, displaying was very much in line with, uh, and this is what the doctor said at the hospital and what the paramedic said uh, the next day, they're very much in line with what looks like an anxiety attack. Now, that's very odd for me because I don't ever see myself as someone who is anxious. Uh, definitely, I have no ang anxiety when I'm speaking in front of people or doing anything which requires me to be in front of people doing things. And I'm a teacher, so I'm, I'm very busy, but it's not something I typically associate with anxiety. But I hear, I'm not an expert in this area, that it could be any number of things that can bring about an anxiety attack. So I think I had that. So it was really, really scary. I'm just recovering. I, I didn't even go to work today. I just started feeling much better in the middle of the day today. And so I would very much appreciate uh, your prayers. 
Um, I believe that God is sovereign even when scary things happen, right? It's those moments in our lives where we have opportunity to display our trust in Christ. He is sovereign and he has all things under control. And so um, I would appreciate prayers and um, I uh, am very thankful that I'm able to be here tonight and to continue what I'm doing. And hopefully uh, not just this conversation, but all of the things that we do on this channel um, honors and glorifies God uh, for years to come, God willing. So um, just wanted to share that with folks. Well, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Joel Setacase from the Think Institute. How's it going, Joel? Hey, doing great, Eli. How are you, man? I'm doing good now. <laughs> doing too hot earlier today and uh, uh, and uh, over the weekend, but um, my wife has been awesome and gave me so much support and encouragement uh, through a scary time. So I'm doing well Praise now. Praise God. So, yeah. Praise God. Yeah, that's good. Well, don't don't tell your wife what my dad always uh, reminded me when I was young, which is oh, okay. the Bible says, "He who finds a wife finds a good thing." but you're still a thing. No, don't, don't say that. <laughs> okay. I won't say that. I promise. Uh, so why don't you tell folks a little bit about your ministry uh, before we kind of jump into our discussion for today? Yeah, sounds great. So I run the Think Institute. I'm the founder and lead teacher, and uh, I'm a former pastor who used to defend my faith the completely wrong way until God changed my attitude and my approach. And now I defend the faith using a three-step presuppositional method. And I know your listeners will be very familiar with that term presuppositional, or if they're not, they're about to become very familiar with it. And um, I also have the distinct privilege of being able to teach that approach to others, both at the high school level, I teach at a local homeschool co-op here in our local area, uh, as well as in churches and conferences, and then weekly on our podcast, which is called Worldview Legacy. And so um, I would commend your listeners and invite your listeners to check out Worldview Legacy. We've got kind of a unique spin on what we do because it's the show that helps Christian laymen to become the worldview leaders that their families and churches need. And yeah. so we're all about helping men who, primarily men, women are invited as well, but primarily men and dads, want to be dads, who want to pass on their faith to the younger generation and are never going to go to seminary but want to be able to give clear, articulate answers to the questions that the world is asking and to do so in a biblical way. That's really what we're all about. Excellent. Very good. Um, well, um, guys, definitely check out his channel. Uh, Joel's actually done a couple of debates, too. If you want to see what presuppositional apologetics looks like in an actual debate context, he's debated um, a few atheists, uh, one of which was uh, Tom Jump who mm -hmm. is a well-known atheist on the interwebs. And I thought you did an excellent job in that interaction. And I don't remember the other gentleman's name, but I remember listening to it and thinking you did a good job. So <laughs> thanks man. Yeah. Well, I've, I've actually, and man, at this point between debates and, and uh, sort of like moderated debates and then informal dialogues, I think I'm, I've had like seven or eight okay. different uh, encounters. Uh, I had a great one with Travis Pangburn on my show. And then, okay. uh, a gentleman who goes by the moniker of um, your friendly neighborhood atheist. He and I went back and forth like yes. five or six times. Okay. And uh, uh, that was, that was a lot of fun. But by the time, by the, like the five or sixth time, it's like, all right, I gotta, you know, like, I'm not saying anything different. Right. So right. Find another right. Christian. well, well, here's the thing for folks who might think that doing debates is useless. Um, uh, if you know anything about debate, you are primarily not trying to convince your interlocutor, your opponent. Right. Uh, now, that'd be nice if by God's grace, the person was convinced uh, these sorts of debates done on a public platform is very much for the audience, uh, people who are on the fence, people who we know God is is working on uh, through his spirit. And of course, obviously, we want our debate opponents to be saved as well, but that's not our primary audience. We want to present a clear case uh, for Christian theism um, because we know many people are watching and people are at different places. Um, and those so sorts of discussions can be used by God in amazing ways. As Joel knows, doing apologetics, we we can probably do an entire show telling stories about how people have been impacted by um, debates and discussions and teachings and things like that. Um, but without further ado, before we actually start, I do want to define some terms for us. So if you uh, notice on the YouTube thumbnail, uh, it is uh, entitled Precept, Tag, and the Apologetics of Jesus. I just want to kind of quickly and briefly define uh, those terms for people who are uninitiated in presuppositional apologetics. Now, one of the main goals of this channel is to popularize this methodology, as I do think it is biblical. I think it is powerful. 
um, and contrary to our uh, classical and evidential brothers, uh, it is a very effective apologetic. Um, but of course, we don't simply go for effectiveness. We go for what we think is based upon biblical principles. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. So presuppositionalism, my favorite definition out of everywhere that I read the definition, more than Bonson, more than Van Til himself, my favorite definition is taken from Stephen D. West's The Resurrection Scripture and Reformed Apologetics, a test for consistency in theology and apologetics. And he defines presuppositionalism like this, quote, Presuppositionalism is a school of thought that attempts to bring all human thinking into subjection to the authority of the word of God. Okay, now methodologically, presuppositional apologetics endeavors to achieve this goal by demonstrating that all human thought that does not submit to the word of God is fallacious and untrustworthy. So that's presuppositionalism in terms of a definition and it's uh, presuppositionalism in terms of what it is and what it's seeking to accomplish um, as a methodology. And of course, I would argue that the transcendental argument, which is typically associated with presuppositionalism, is a very important part of what that looks like when it is played out in an apologetic interaction. All right. So Joel shocked the Internet uh, with a post that he uh, that he put out on Facebook. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the context that led you to posting what you posted and perhaps you can clarify what you meant. And then we can kind of jump in maybe if there's some disagreement between you and I about sure. um, the relationship between presuppositionalism and um, the transcendental argument, we can kind of talk about that and move on from there. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds great. I've also got um, uh, some notes on an apologetic encounter of Jesus where I think that he uses the kind of presuppositional approach that I teach and that I advocate for. Would it be all right if we got into that a little bit as well? Yeah, I also would like to know what it, do you think is the difference between the method you use, this three-step approach, and what presuppositionalism already kind of tries to set out? I don't know if you think there's yeah. a difference. Uh, if you do think there's a difference, maybe you can hash that out for us, and then we can interact a little bit. Yeah, that sounds great. Cool. Okay. So, okay, so where do we begin? Uh, do I, oh, I'll talk about the post yeah. that, I, that I posted, right. So why, why you why are you making the internet mad, bro? Come on, man, you're so divisive. I know, <laughs> I know. Kidding. The internet was so so calm and placid until I posted that. Placid. I haven't heard that word in a while. Uh, right, yeah, go for it, I'm man. trying to bring it back. So um, so here's what happened. So uh, my brother Parker, he's uh, he's my little brother, but I, I had to stop calling him that years ago because uh, once he became a, a, a state wrestler in college uh, i had to stop calling him my little brother because he was a beast he was bigger than me right but he'll always be my little brother and uh he's got his own show parker's pence he's definitely checked that out very heavy on the philosophy yeah uh just excellent excellent stuff fascinating but uh he and i don't get to see each other as much anymore as we used to he lives about an hour and a half away but we still text back and forth, whether it's a, a gif or a meme or, uh, you know, some serious apologetics discussion, sure. philo philosophical discussion. And I just texted him the other day. Um, and I don't have my phone or else I'd, I'd look up the exact text. But I basically said, hey, man, you know, um, I don't remember my exact words, Eli, but it was something along the lines of I think I'm going to give up on tag. Now, that's typical set of case hy hyperbole. OK, uh, <laughs> that's not <laughs> that's. You got to understand how we talk to each other. Okay. All right. Um, but, and, and he and I talked a little bit about Romans 1. What does Romans 1 actually say? About, and who does it say it about in terms of who is suppressing the truth? And and what what happens to the mind and uh, to the to the, the moral sense, uh, the conscience, if you will, after that truth is suppressed? How far does the suppression go? Anyway, we're, you know, it's a text conversation. We're not going uber deep, but we're just talking back and forth. And um, one of the things that I do on a semi-regular basis is I'll get into the different Facebook groups I'm a part of and either, you know, comment, participate, engage, uh, or just try to start conversations myself. And so I made the heinous mistake of getting into the reformed presuppositional <laughs> apologetics group and, uh, and just, just posting that I had been thinking about this. Like, again, yeah. using that, the set of case hyperbole, I said something along the lines of, um, yeah, I'm thinking about giving up on tag. Mm -hmm. One, because to, it's it's rarely effective with the uninitiated atheist or something along the, uh, the uninitiated skeptic or non-believer. Okay. And two, now this, this set people off, um, but I, I stand by it. Two, I said, you don't see it in scripture. Now, here's what I meant by that. What I meant is, and, and I appreciate your desire to define our terms. Mm -hmm. What I meant is that the specific 
transcendental argument for God's existence, which appeals to the preconditions for intelligibility or uh, which talks about predication or the, the transcendentals, you, uh, as an argument for the existence of God, you don't see that argument in scripture. What I was getting at, Eli, is that, look, you don't have to use a Vantillian transcendental argument every time you go out there and defend your faith, especially if the person that you're speaking with is uninitiated. In other words, they don't, they don't know. They've never once thought about what their grounding is for logic. They've never once thought, they've been calling Christians irrational for years, and they've never once thought about that. And quite frankly, you're going to have to do a lot of legwork and a lot of ground laying to get them to even understand it. Mm-hmm. And so, so um, I posted that and uh, it, it was like, I, it was like, I pulled the plug out of the, the dam and all the water started coming out little, little by little at well, first. Well, Go can ahead. I say, can I say something in defense of the reformed presuppositional apologetics, Please. which uh, I love group. those guys. Don't get me wrong. It, of course. No, I'm sure. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I mean, it's not a, a crazy point, but when you when you said something to the effect of the set a case hyperbole, you have to understand that when you post something on Facebook, not everyone who's reading your post will be aware of the set a case hyperbole. Oh, for so sure. you know, you know what I'm saying. So I'm yeah. sure there were kind of like knee jerk responses, not really knowing the context and the frame of mind with which you were posting that. So I'm pretty yeah. sure that's probably uh, that was probably a contributing factor to uh, maybe some of the the pushback there, which I haven't been following. Um, I just heard a few things here and there, but uh, yeah. I know how Facebook can be. Yeah, sure. And, you know, I'm sure you're right, Eli. The, the, I will say some of the comments, and and I think I cleared that up in the comments. I mean, there was a pretty lengthy comment thread, Mm -hmm. but, but some of the comments, now this is where I started to get really perplexed because a lot of the comments were along the lines of, there is no presuppositional apologetics without tag, specifically without the transcendental argument for God. Mm -hmm. it's all tag. And I said, well, that's just not true. And what I tried to do is I tried to define my terms. And I know, well, I'm interested to hear your thoughts because we've Mm -hmm. talked a little bit about this back uh, on the phone. But my point was that specifically referring to the transcendentals or the preconditions of intelligibility, um, you, you don't have to refer to those explicitly every time you make a presuppositional defense. At least I hope not, because Jesus didn't. And Jesus argued presuppositionally, as did Paul. And not once did Jesus mention the words logic, science, morality, or predication. So I sure hope that you can argue presuppositionally without expressly appealing to those things or explaining how they presuppose God. Yeah. So so tag, uh, that term tag, which stands for the transcendental argument for the existence of God, is thrown around very loosely, but I do think that that we need to make a distinction between tag as an argument and um, transcendental reasoning as a principle. Um, I do not think you can separate a transcendental principle from presuppositionalism because everything we do, we reason from the principle that God is the necessary precondition. But that said, that does not require, nor did Van Til believe that to be the case, that did not require that we had to offer, quote, a transcendental argument every time. Yeah. But we always argue according to a transcendental principle. And that is consistent with starting where the unbeliever is, having a conversation with them, and always having the background music of the Christian worldview and the need to be consistent with those principles, even when we talk about specific data points. So there is a difference between giving a formal transcendental argument and talking about data points in a way that is consistent with our overall commitment to the authority of scripture and God himself. So um, regardless of what I do, if I give a formal argument or I talk about the nature of history and whether it can be known, I never stop using a transcendental principle, even though when I speak of history, right, I'm not offering a transcendental argument. Right. Right. So you never stop reasoning transcendentally. 
but that's not the same as giving a formal argument. So when someone says tag is not in the Bible, no presuppositionalist that I know of would say um, that there is a Bible verse that formally lays out the argument for tag. Um, I think that, uh, and I'll be quiet after this and, and, hear, and hear your thoughts. I think that tag is derived from biblical principles and theological teaching. So we can take, for instance, the idea of a completely sovereign God and draw implications from a biblical doctrine of God and use this as a premise of an argument or something along those lines. Uh, we can derive the creator-creature distinction uh, from Genesis 1.1, and there are apologetic applications that can be made uh, you know, based upon the nature of God, the nature of knowledge. We can use the more formal um, language, ectypal, archetypal knowledge. You'll never use that in, a, in an actual day-to-day -day conversation, but right. there are implications there. Uh, the biblical conception of authority as God being the ultimate, as we see that God swears by himself because he can swear by none other. The doctrine of total depravity, uh, the effects of sin upon the mind of man, how man distorts God's revelation. There's no neutrality, these sorts of things. I would argue that the transcendental argument is based upon biblical principles. And in that sense, I would say it is biblical, but I would not say it's biblical in the sense that no presuppositionalist says it is. Namely, there is a formal argument along those lines. Uh, because basically, and I'll stop here, I promise, we don't see um, we don't see cosmological arguments or teleological arguments or anything like that in the Bible. You have principles that we can derive premises and use arguments along those lines. So tag can be complicated, but that's all depending upon the nature of the thing under under discussion, right? Someone says, well, that's too complicated. Why don't you just use the cosmological argument? Well, Use the cosmological argument, you're off running talking about potential and actual infinites, quantum physics, and all sorts of things. It can get really uh, difficult. But as Bonson has shown, uh, you can use the transcendental argument in very amateur ways while still maintaining that overall transcendental thrust that I think is required by the methodology. There, I'm done. You can, you can share your thoughts there. That's a, a mouthful. No, I agree with you that tag as such, the specific yeah. transcendental argument for God is derived from scriptural principles. And that was the one thing that I maintained in that group. I, I right. said, yeah, I, of course, absolutely. Um, well, part of it could be part of the, part of my, my desire to push back against some of this could be, uh, well, one, it's because I started getting pushback. I started, here's the thing, Eli, I started getting the kind of pushback that most of it was fine, good natured, good faith. Sure. But then, the, but then there was some pushback that was, uh, let's just say, less than optimally Christian. <laughs> and, okay. And there was and I won't get into details because who cares? But, sure. um, but, and and when that kind of stuff happens, I mean that you know, I mean that kind of makes me want to fight back. You know that sure. well now now I'm becoming more entrenched in my position. But part of the reason why I want to push back against some of this thinking is that one, I'm a former pastor. I, I ministered in the city of Chicago and in the town of Plainfield. Um, you know, I've, I've, um, yes, I've got a, a seminary degree, but I've, I've never taught in seminary. I've never taught philosophy at the university level. I'm used to working with blue collar and white collar, mostly dads who are out there trying to make an impact for the gospel in their local area. Mm -hmm. And if I tell these guys, they need to reason transcendentally, uh, okay, Joel, like, I'm going to have to translate that. Now, I might be able to say the same thing, uh -huh. but when I'm thinking about what does it mean to reason transcendentally, I'm thinking, how can I put that in terms that the guys that I ministered to, and they're not dummies. I mean, these are very well accomplished guys. Okay. But they're not philosophers. Um, how, how can they understand it? Well, I might say something like, look, you can't abandon the Bible to defend the Bible. You start, and I know you would say the exact same thing. Eli. I've heard you say yeah. such things, you know, countless times. Okay, but you start from the basis, the foundational presupposition. I'm fine using that term. I love it. That the Bible and all that it affirms about God, the universe, and the human self mm -hmm. are true. And you just start with that. You figure out what the Bible says. Learn how to ask great questions to uncover the underlying presuppositions and contradictions in your your neighbor's um, worldview and position. Um, and then there's this, there's this very simple three-step process that I always advocate for and teach, but it's really just a matter of standing on God's word and just not wavering from the fact that everything that God affirms in scripture is true unequivocally. Now you have to figure out what that means, right? You know, not every passage is as clear as others. The apostle Peter says that, but 
So, so that's how I, I ask you. If I could ask you real quick, so you have difficulty, and this is a question: you have difficulty laying out a transcendental argument to a blue collar unbeliever. It, it almost seems to me that um, if you understand the argument, it's just as simple as asking, "Hey, man, how do you make sense out of your life, man, without without yeah. a maker? I want to hear your story." Right there yeah. is a layman's transcendental argument because I don't think he's going to give me a sufficient answer. So at that point, I'm actually laying out in very common blue collar way, like, dude, with all the stuff that you have going on, how do you make sense out of the world you live in? You know, no, and, and, that's and, great. Hear, and hear him. And I think that is a transcendental argument, not formally laid out. So sure. I'm having difficulty seeing like what you're saying, like, I don't see this. It's very difficult to communicate this. But then we change the wording to more simple way. Like, how's that different? So like when you sure. shared your, your three steps. It seemed like what you're doing is basically just simplifying what the transcendental argument is anyway. Uh, yeah, but I think we're talking about two different things. So, I'm, so okay. I was just um, maybe, maybe I can, maybe let me let me say this and tell me if this this helps okay. clear clear things a little bit. So, uh, on the one hand, I'm talking about the guys that I'm teaching the apologetic to. Okay. I wasn't I wasn't talking about the guys that I might be meeting on the street, uh, I see, I street see. Okay. or something like that. Okay. Now. Um, it, it, let's say, you know, uh, let's say I am on the street. Let's say somebody goes, uh, uh, Christians are immoral. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, look, we can talk about morality. That's perfectly fine. Like that's, that's one of those transcendentals or, the, or that's one of those, um, preconditions for intelligibility, you right. know, uh, moral law. Sure. Absolutely. We can do that. And that's a very, that's a very common one. Logic gets a little bit more hard to understand, which, but, but right. People can, you know, people can understand that. Sure. sure. Science. I mean, I love the way Jeff Durbin talks about science, you know, and, and uh, talking about um, uniformity in nature and induction and all that. And, and, you know, I'll, I will often translate those terms if I'm speaking to a non-believer, mm -hmm. but let me give you an example of um, a, a, a way of using some, a time that I used presuppositional apologetics, which I don't think is Vantillian tag. Even if you might want to say, yeah, but you were you were doing that in the background. Sure, that's fine. But um, but a couple, let's say a year and a half ago, I was down in New Orleans. I was doing some street preaching okay. with uh, with some guys down there. Zoe White and Declaring Truth Ministries, excellent ministry. Zoe's a good friend. And I'm down there, and I wasn't preaching at the time, but I was handing out tracts, starting up conversations with people as they walk by. Young dude, 25 years old, comes up to me. And we get to talking and this guy is great, really personable, you know, smiley, happy, uh, just the kind of guy you want to talk to. Just a nice, cool guy. And like you. To talk, like, like you. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how this conversation goes. <laughs> okay. But uh, but he goes, he goes, I, we talk about Jesus. Like, what do you think of Jesus? He goes, I have nothing against Jesus. I just haven't been convinced that, you know, that he's God or that I need to follow. him. I'm paraphrasing here. Sure. And in other words, what he was saying is he's neutral towards Jesus. Well, all my precept alarm bells start going off because there's no neutrality. Sure. All right. So, so um, what I did was first I told him, I said, you know, it's interesting. You say you're neutral towards Jesus. Can I tell you what Jesus said about that? Jesus said that whoever is not with him is against him. Whoever does not gather with him scatters. Mm -hmm. So Jesus really didn't leave the option to be neutral. You're either with him or against him. And all of a sudden, this young man, his his demeanor changed, and he started looking more grim. And he looked right at me, and he said, I could never believe in someone who said that. Right then and there, he realized he is not neutral towards Jesus. He had a false right. view of Jesus, and Jesus does not allow him to be neutral towards him in that way. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I reduced his position to absurdity because he's claiming to be neutral towards Jesus, but the very words of Jesus negate his neutrality. Okay, sure. so reduced it to absurdity. We continued talking. I presented the the uh, Christian worldview and invited him to believe in Jesus, and uh, you know he walked away not a, not yet a believer, and really with maybe a bit of a more grim outlook towards Christianity. Sure, only because he realized the demand that Jesus was making on him was much more than he had made. So, mm -hmm. really quickly, because I haven't laid out laid it out explicitly yet, but the three steps there are one: reduce the uh, here. Here's how I phrase it. One, show the problem with the unbelieving position. Okay. Okay. Reduce it to absurdity, if you will. Okay. Perform, perform a reductio ad absurdum. Uh, two, show how the Bible solves that problem. 
All right. So right. what you're doing there, so you, in a sense, you're inviting the unbeliever to walk down into your basement and take a look at your foundation after you've just shown him the crack in his. And right. You're you're doing an internal critique on the Christian position. Right. And then three, pivot to the gospel, or as I say, show how Jesus solves the ultimate problem. So show okay. how show the problem with his position, show how the Bible solves that problem, and show how Jesus solves the ultimate problem. Okay. And um, and involved in step two is is often a step that um, not all presuppositionalists take, but I, I I like it, which is not only show how you need the Bible in order to make sense of the very categories, but also show how the Bible lays out the rules for those categories and doesn't violate those rules. So someone says, um, okay, you know, someone someone says uh, uh, the God of the Bible is immoral. Yeah. Well, you're, you're going to show them that you need God for morality, but you're also going to show him whatever his objection was. You're going to show him how God is not, not actually immoral for what I have a question. I have a question. I'm sorry. I'm rambling. I'm rambling. No, no, no. You're my guest. You're my guest. Uh, so everything you just said is literally Van Tillian. <laughs> like there's nothing you said. Like, Ed, so, so like name, if you could do me a favor. So name the yeah. step one. What was the step one? I, first of all, I know it's Van Tillian, but it's not. It's but transcendental it's, as well. Well, okay. Well, show me how that, because okay. that's one of the reasons I wanted to come on here is so yeah. that you could, you could explain that to me. Okay. So, so step so one, we'll step, step one. So what was step one again? Step one, show the problem with his position. Okay. That's an internal critique. Correct. Uh, well, yes, yes. It's an internal critique. Although the way I typically teach it is I just refer to it as the reductio ad absurdum. That Bonson uses the same language. Right. That, that's an internal critique. Yes. It's you're doing an internal critique of the non-Christian position first. Which is a reductio. Yes, you're reducing it to absurdity. Which is I, which is the Proverbs twenty, I think it's Proverbs twenty six principle, right? Yeah, uh, Proverbs answer 26, the fool according to his folly. So you're you're right in line with mm -hmm. traditional Vantillian yes. uh, categories. And and that's actually part of the transcendental argument. So yeah. um, there are two steps to the transcendental argument as I see it, but you can you can cut it up in different ways the way you present it. It's still no, I, I add a third one. Yeah, that's fine. But even your third category is is perfectly in line with event with Van Tillian category. So you have an internal critique. What was the second point? So yeah, so the reductio, and then the second one is is um, show how the Bible solves the problem. Okay, so that's your po that's your positive case. That's how we Correct. actually. That's your positive case, right? And that's and I refer to that as the internal critique of the Christian position. And the reason I don't use the same term for both is because I teach high schoolers this, and yeah. I don't want them to get too confused. Um, yeah. So I say, you know, start with the reductio, then do the internal critique of the Christian position, and then step three. But um, whatever language you use, you're still using internal critique the of the unbeliever. You're yes. welcoming the unbeliever to internally critique ours. Mm -hmm. And then I think if, if I remember correctly, you said pivot to the gospel. Yeah, which is shorthand. What, the way I actually phrase it is uh, show, how the, show how Jesus solves the ultimate problem. Right. Which is sin. The ultimate problem is sin. By the way, spoiler alert, anyone listening, the ultimate problem is sin and right. you need Jesus to it forgive is. you. It is. Um, but that's that that it just is Vantillian presuppositionalism. It's yeah. exactly what Bonson showed when he yes. when he had an entire chapter in, I think it's Van Til's apologetic, where he talks about the relationship between theology, apologetics, and evangelism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So those three prongs, I mean, you're you're right there. There's nothing you said from at least for me. I've read Bonson, I've read Van Til. There's nothing you said that's different, except perhaps the wording and maybe emphasis, like you've split it up and Three steps instead of like you know yeah. two steps. Answer the fool, don't answer the fool. But you're yeah. you're basically giving a transcendental argument. Number one, your positive case demonstrates the exclusive truth of your own view, and your internal critique gives an illustration of the truth of your view, namely that given the unbeliever's perspective, he really doesn't have a foundation for for anything. You might right. not be using the language logic and transcendentals, but that I mean you just summed up beautifully. Uh, the transcendental argument and transcendental principle. Okay. So, so yeah, li listen, I, I didn't come up with this on my own. I mean, I've, I've yeah. been reading Van Til for years. I, sure. The, the, the thinker who's most influenced me in, in these terms and along these lines rather is John frame and John frame, as you know, was a student of Van Til right. articulated things a little bit differently than Van Til, but I wrote one of my capstone papers for my master's on, um, on frame and uh, man, I just love the way John Frame thinks. I mean, every like everything I read from that guy is like, oh, it's so good. Except he's a Presbyterian, I'm a Baptist, but hey, no one's perfect, <laughs> um, you know. And so, um, uh, and then and then after him would be, you know, I mean, of course Van Til, uh, of course Bonson, um, 
And then, you know, uh, more modern guys, Jeff Durbin, Saiten Brigancade, who's my friend that I've worked with, and uh, right. and James White. But um, uh, Francis Schaefer as well. And Francis okay. Schaefer had such, I mean, you listen, you if you read uh, John Frame talk about Francis Schaefer, he talks about how at his heart, he's really an evangelist. And so right. he's, he's a presuppositionalist, but he's, you know, he's, he doesn't formulate things quite as expl explicitly as Van Til. But okay, the reason why I mention all this is this, is because... Um, the way that I present things is I'm trying to give believers a tool to share the gospel. Um, and, and to share the gospel, you have to be ready to answer any objection that comes up. And I do think this approach can answer any objection. Eli, where, where I get hung up, and I think maybe where people get have gotten hung up with what I say, I'm not advocating for anything other than presuppositionalism. I just don't think you have to... All I'm saying is I define tag as such, as an argument from the specific preconditions of intelligibility. Now, you can fill in that list with, with whatever you want. I mean, not whatever you want, but the, whether well, it's you, logic. You could. Int intelligible experience. Sure. Lo but, but specifically those right. transcendentals, you know, logic, yeah. moral law, um, sure. the, the preconditions for science, that sort of thing. You could talk about predication and that's getting a little in, more into the weeds, sure. but fine. Yeah. Okay. But, um, but what I, what I did with my friend on the street my new friend on the street was you know i didn't say hey listen man in order to make sense of anything in order in order to even have logic in the first place or you know moral law in order for there to be a, a objective morality i didn't go to those transcendentals um instead i i it was a presuppositional approach i stepped into his worldview and showed him how it was absurd then i invited him into my worldview for the sake of argument that's transcendental. <laughs> okay, so explain. So, so there's explain. literally nothing. There's nothing you're saying that's not transcendental. But how, but I wasn't. You're doing. You're doing something that Bonson was doing in his debate with Gordon Stein. He gave a transcendental argument. You have a formal context there, so obviously we're not going to use this in like day to day. But he emphasized one specific thing: logic. Mm -hmm. But then in his debate against um, uh, Edward Tabash. He gave a transcendental argument, but it looked different than what he gave in the Stein debate because his emphasis was induction. Now, if we step away from logic and induction, we can talk about any fact without using transcendental language because we're going to communicate to someone, right? And you're not laying it all out. Even Bonson said, we presuppose the Christian worldview, but we can only talk about one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. So we could always buy the next cup of coffee. There's nothing wrong with sharing the little bits, what you just shared, if this is how you taught it, or this is how you, you use it. Um, and then have a further conversation. I don't always talk about, um, you know, transcendental categories, but my foot, so to speak, is always stepping in the category that God is my foundation. And as much mm -hmm. as I do that, and I ask in a generic way, Hey man, you know, I, I understand that. I, mean, I see the world from a Christian perspective. I know you don't share that. You know, how do you make sense out of your perspective? I'm already now engaging in the steps of the transcendental argument, which out without using the impossibility of the contrary, because I wouldn't use that in a normal conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm still doing that without using the terminology. It seems to me that you seem that the terminology entails that, oh, because I have to say it in this, this particular way of arguing, but I don't think that that's really what we're seeing, you know, maybe Jesus doing or something like that. Yeah. You're still using a transcendental principle. Everything you're saying, I'm saying yes and amen to, and I don't see any disagreement whatsoever. Okay, so the fact that you're calling it a transcendental principle, and I, I again, listen, I'm I not really, calling that that that's Van Til. Right. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Fantastic. And I and 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 um, I think this is where I don't know if you remember, but when we were on the phone the other day, mm -hmm. you told me you explained the difference between the transcendental argument as such versus a transcendental method or approach. I forget which term you use, method or approach. A principle. Yeah. Principle. Okay. So. I, I told you that you explained that better in like 30 seconds than uh, the, I, I thought you explained it very well. I'll just say that. Well, thank you. You don't have yes, to tell me. Yes. Show, well, it's your show. You. I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> you know, oh, we're not worthy. Um, <laughs> um, how old are you, Joe? Uh, how, old do you, how old do you think I am? I don't know. In your mid 30s? Oh, thank you. I'm 38. I'll be 39. Okay. Year. So I'm, I just turned 40. Uh, the reason why I ask Ooh. is because you're using movie references and I feel like there's a connection because yes. I use movie references to some people <laughs> like, way right. over their head. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Yeah, that, that's sure. I, I mean, go up. I was like, "How old are you?" He's like, "Whoa, wait a second. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm. I mean, I'm just. Uh, you know, I'm just curious. No, no worries. Um, no worries. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I'm. I'm. I. Um. Oh man, you threw me off. What the heck? Were you uh, that was oh, my yeah. plan. Okay. Yeah. Well, it succeeded. <laughs> uh, okay. So so let me tell you. Uh, here's here's my point. Mm -hmm. Someone, if the fact that when you look at the way Jesus, um, when you look at the way, man, I really want to get into this example from Matthew 12. I don't know if we have time, but when yeah, you look at the way, okay, so you look at the way Jesus defended the faith. He is, obviously, he's starting from the presupposition that God's word is always true. Of course. Yeah. And if that's all we're saying, then then there is no, there is no issue here whatsoever. Sure. Okay. But um, if you look at the way Jesus defended the truth, and let me, let me tell you what, let me just get into the example here. This is Matthew 12, one through 14. Okay. Uh, fine. If we hop into it. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what's going on in this passage after Jesus heals a man who's been oppressed by a demon, Pharisees accuse him of operating by Satan's power. Jesus then exposes their absurdity and turns their accusation around on them. He then reveals his messianic identity and gives the Pharisees an ultimatum. All right. So basically what's going on here, exorcisms were extremely rare in the old Testament period, but it was expected that when the Messiah came, at least this is, this is the idea when the Messiah came, he would, he would be like David and be able to exercise demons. Sure. Um, David played his harp, exercised Saul's demon, which of course came back because, Hey, D David's not Jesus. Okay. What do you want from him? Okay. He can, he can exercise it for a short period of time. Jesus can just say leave. And then uh, David has to get his instrument out. <laughs> Which right. demon is this? I need, I think I need a guitar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He tried it with the accordion that just brought more demons. So that was no good. But, um, so, uh, so Jesus, Jesus heals this, this person who is demon possessed. Mm -hmm. And, um, the Pharisees accuse him of being fueled by Beelzebul. Beelzebul is a name derived from Baal or Baal. Baal is the pagan god worshipped by the Canaanites, the enemies of ancient Israel. It means master of the house. So that's Beelzebul. And it's, it's come at this point to be a euphemism for Satan. And so they're accusing Jesus of being fueled by Satan. Jesus does something good. They accuse him of being evil. All right. Uh, oldest trick in the book. It's still going on today, by the way. Uh, we yeah. can get into that another time, maybe. But so what does Jesus do? Here's his three steps. Step one, he begins by stating a principle that they agree with. Okay. Every kingdom divided against itself is headed for I'm destruction. I'm going to stop right there. I have to stop right there. Go. Oh. When you just use that word, the words, he started with something that they agreed with. That right there is... Tra that's a that's a form of transcendental argument because transcendental argument starts with an agreed upon fact by both parties and then we ask what are the preconditions now jesus wouldn't use that language right he doesn't but he doesn't okay, okay. but he demonstrates the foolishness and self-refutation yes, yes, of yes right that's literally that's the said, transcendental argument that's <laughs> what i'm calling that's what i'm calling presuppositionalism but i'm not but jesus doesn't go to the preconditions of intelligibility he's not going down to the substrate of human experience he's not you know what i'm saying he's, what he's using a he's using the transcendental principle which you're just calling presuppositionalism but Correct. i'm just saying that Correct. just is transcendental Correct. principles right and that's and and i'm afraid this whole thing boils down to just we're using different terms i think that's what it is and and the but the fact that you're willing to say it's a transcendental principle without calling it tag necessarily unless i misunderstand you well, I, no trans and no presuppositionalist worth his salt would call applications of the transcendental principle a transcendental argument. I mean, would, they wouldn't say that. But again, we're always functioning in transcendental categories. Let me read you a quote. Do you mind if I read you a quote? No, no, I don't. But I'm going to need you to define the word transcendental because maybe that's where I'm getting hung up or maybe that's where others are getting hung up. Or maybe that's where you're getting hung up, Eli. No, I'm just kidding. Well, but, uh, well it's, it's always arguing along with the, with the framework in mind that God is the one who gives meaning to everything that we're doing and that in our disagreement with the unbeliever, that fact is illustrated, namely that there's a disagreement and that God is required to make sense out of the disagreement. 
Now, how we apply that to specific data points is going to depend on the nature of the conversation. If I'm debating an atheist on YouTube, I might use logic, something more intellectually rigorous. If I'm talking to a guy on the street, I might use a specific application of, say, like a moral argument, which is transcendental, right? Um, Mor morality is, but but again, it's a transcendental I, principle. Yes. Uh, so right. when I when I hear transcendental, I'm thinking of those principles that transcend material reality that are true in all possible then we're, then that's where that's where we're disagreeing so i yes that's that's the way what transcendental could be understood i'm on i'm thinking in terms of what a transcendental argument seeks to do the principles upon which that's based is seen in everything you're saying so a transcendental argument in general if i can use kind of the technical terminology uh, mm -hmm. goes something like this x is a necessary condition for the possibility of y where then, given that Y is the case, it logically follows that X must be the case too. So what you just said, we start, Jesus started with a principle they agreed with. There we go. X, yeah. <laughs> right? So X, or I'm sorry, Y. X is the necessary precondition for the Y. So we demonstrate the truth right. of Y by showing that um, X doesn't make sense without Y. Mm. Now that's, sure. that's, that's all kind of formal logic there, but the principle plays out in conversation in every in every point that you laid out. So we, whether we're talking about and Jesus is, is appealing to evidences or anything like that, he never does so without using the principle behind it, even though we, no presuppositionals would argue Jesus is using a formal argument. But he understands the interconnectedness of everything he's saying. I wanted to read this quote yeah. I thought was interesting. Um, quote, this is what the quote says, when one gives up Christian belief, one thereby deprives oneself of the right to Christian morality, for example. Christianity is a system, a consistently thought out and complete view of things. If one breaks out of it a fundamental idea, the belief in God, for example, one thereby breaks the whole thing to pieces. One has nothing of any consequence left in one's hands. Christian morality is a command. Its origin is transcendental. It possesses truth only if God is truth. It stands or falls with belief in God. Guess who said mm -hmm. that quote? Uh, well, John Frame. No, Friedrich Nietzsche. <laughs> really? He, he understood that <laughs> we can talk about, this is Friedrich Nietzsche. It's a quote like it. in uh, Cornelius Plantinga Jr.'s Engaging God's World, A Christian Vision of Faith, Learning, and Living. Even wow. Friedrich Nietzsche understood that you take morality, you take any aspect of a system, Right. And you remove it from that system. That's it. The sure. whole Christian worldview is an interconnected system. And when we talk about one, mm -hmm. we're always talking about it in the context of that only has meaning given the system. Now, okay. when I talk to people, right, I'm not using the tag argument, but the principle is always in play given the very nature of the Christian worldview as a system. So I'm never leaving a transcendental principle, although I may not be using a transcendental argument. Okay. So, okay. So, uh, morality again, though, is, is one of those yeah. transcendent realities. Yeah. Uh, it, it's wrong to murder in all possible worlds. Murder by definition is wrong. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's, there's no possible world in which murder is right. So what I'm, and I, maybe you're just going to say this is the transcendental principle. That's fine. What Jesus does though, in Matthew 12, he starts by stating the principle. Okay. Jesus is not making an argument for morality or logic or any or or any immaterial transcendent truth. He's I'm not saying he's not being logical, Eli. Okay. I'm not saying he's not being moral. Right. Yeah. Okay. What I'm saying is he's not he's not um he's not holding up morality and saying for morality to be a thing, for this to be a meaningful category. X must be true. God's word must be true. I must be Messiah. Um, here's what he, okay. So what he's doing, he states the principle and um, let me see if I can somehow get my train of thought back there. Uh, this has been really good, but it's also uh, uh, distracting. So I'm going to try. While you're looking for it, I just want to tell the audience, if you guys have any questions, um, we are coming up to the top of the hour soon. So we'll start taking questions if there are any. Um, but please preface your question with question, and we'll take a, a few of them. Um, if folks uh, looked at the thumbnail a while back and, and the time said 9 p.m., 
uh, because of my situation over the weekend, I kind of made it earlier so that we could end earlier and I can get a good night's sleep uh, mm. so I can get to work. So um, we're coming up to the end here uh, soon. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask away, whether it's for myself or Joel, or you want us to both interact with something, uh, we'll try our best. But uh, just wanted to throw that out there. If there are no questions, that's fine as well. Go ahead, Joel. Okay, so here's what Jesus does. So they're accusing him of working for Satan. And they're basically saying, we've uncovered Satan's evil plot. Mm -hmm. Satan's evil plot is he's going around casting out demons uh, through this guy, through Jesus, in order to win converts for Satan, essentially. This is Satan's nefarious plot. Look how he's using this guy who's this false claimant to the, the Messiah ship. Uh, all right, so what Jesus does is he goes, look, a house divided against itself is, uh, it, it can't stand, all right? In other words, you, um, your one, what does that mean? That means either I'm clearly, obviously not working for Satan because Satan wouldn't work against himself. Satan wouldn't do the very thing that would cause his house to collapse. Uh, that you don't believe that about Satan, you you dummies. You don't. Uh, that's my paraphrase. You don't believe that Satan would actively oppose himself. In fact, that your whole accusation is: look how wily and crafty this Satan is. He's trying to trick us. Well, if Satan's working against himself, then Satan is an idiot. And that goes against your entire argument. There's an internal consistency here. You can have it where I'm working for Satan and Satan is therefore impotent and, and stupid. Or you can accept the obvious truth that I'm clearly not working for Satan. Those are your options. But right. either way, I'm not a threat to you. Either way, I'm not actually serving the enemy. I'm not. So, actually is, so is he doing apologetics at that point or is he just trying to clarify their own misunderstanding? No, I think he's reducing their position to absurdity. He's showing them that they are absurd for for believing it. I, again, I think this is step one of his of his approach. But see right. what I so what I'm what I'm trying to figure out is how does that fit into the transcendental scheme or the 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 it's the at the heart of the scheme. It's okay, the heart but he's of the scheme. he's reducing it to absurdity. But what is the transcendent category, or what is the it, the categories can what is be, the immaterial they're, principle? they're not explicitly stated, but the, it's the frame, it's the unspoken framework with which these Pharisees are coming at Jesus that are being reduced to absurdity, namely the proposition in their mind that Jesus isn't who he says he is. Right. So they have, they have a, a, a gap in their worldview and Jesus responding to their view, showing that it's absurdity is kind of a, a way of showing, Hey, the reason why you don't make sense is because you're not seeing me in the proper, in the proper light, namely right. the light of scripture. And that you see in other places where Jesus says that, that, you know, you believe Moses, um, but Moses wrote about me. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, again, I don't think it's explicit per se, but I think the principle is, is still there. I think the difference that we're having is that um, when you say, tag is different than presuppositionalism. I'm just thinking, okay, but presuppositionalism is just a transcendental principle applied to unbelief. Um, it's not a transcendental argument. The way it can come out and be formulated, it can be formulated as a formal argument, mm -hmm. but we're always reasoning in accordance with a, a, a transcendental principle. And I would agree, Jesus is using a reductio at that point, which again is very consistent with presuppositionalism. Mm -hmm. I love the book. I don't know if you've ever read the book by Norman Geisler, um, I'm sorry, I have to quote Norman Geisler. It whoa, was whoa. not very friendly to presuppositionalism. Lost half your subscribers. However, I do think he wrote a very good book entitled The Apologetic of Jesus. Hmm. And while I disagree with his conclusions and how he interprets what Jesus is doing, I do think he did an excellent job highlighting some of the kinds of apologetic elements that Jesus would use. For example, Jesus used the use of testimony. He mm -hmm. used the uh, miracles as an apologetic. He used yeah. his own resurrection parables to prove a point or argue a point through his various discourses, the appeal to prophecy and various forms of argumentation, which Joel uh, mentioned in Matthew, where he's showing a reductio there. Okay. All of this is completely consistent with presuppositionalism. And I would argue is just a multifaceted application to the general principle, uh, which Van Til would agree with, Bonson would agree with. It's the difference, for example, Joel, between someone says, well, well do we have to use presuppositional arguments or can we use evidences also? <laughs> People make that yes. mistake when I use evidences, right. when Jesus uses prophecy, discourse, parables, miracles, resurrection, yeah. he does so in a way that is fully consistent with a Vantillian um, method. Yeah. So that that's all I'm saying. So, it, so there literally may be no difference between what you say and what I say here, Eli, because um, 
if if you if you call this what I'm again, I'll just sort of repeat my method. If you call this transcendental argumentation, then then there's no space between our positions. We principle. just use different terms. I yeah. would say you're using the transcendental principle without using a formal argument in your in your generic day to day communication, which is perfectly fine. I, th I think yeah. that's probably where we most mostly will have to be when we're talking at kind of like the evangelism level. So I want yeah, to tell yeah. my audience there's a difference between the way they see presuppositionalism used here on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're, we we talk to people who are kind of on the same wavelength. This yeah. is going to look very different when we talk to the man on the street, the blue collar guy that you that you spoke about, whether we're sh teaching it to blue collar Christians mm -hmm. or sharing it with blue collar pagans. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Right. That's right. Yeah. So if, if all it is, is um, you are, well, what, what I what I always tell people is that you really just need two skills to defend your faith. That's mm -hmm. it. The first skill is you need to know how to ask good questions. And the list of questions isn't even really that long. What no. do you mean by that? How'd you come to believe that? By what standard? Questions like that. Right. Okay. Is that always true? That sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and Frank then Tarek comes in. Was that? <laughs> I love, I love his intro in the, in his podcast. If someone says there's no truth, you ask them, is that true? I love it. It's like echoes in my, in my, uh, in my ears. <laughs> that's good. Well, you got you got Norm Geisler and Frank Turek, man. So that's right. I, I, this is what I like. This is what I like about your show. It's it's, it's we're all inclusive it's, here, even though we have strong disagreements. It's all right. <laughs> that's right. So, you know, um, man, where was I? Uh, yeah. So ask the right questions, and then really just know what the Bible teaches. If you mm -hmm. know what the Bible teaches about a few key areas, and the first person I actually heard that from, you know who it was, Vody exactly. Bauckham. I heard an apologetics talk from Vody Bauckham years ago. And he said, if you just know what the Bible teaches about like six key areas, you'll be fine. You yeah. can defend your faith. And so, um, you know, I've got three that I typically share, you know, when I teach apologetics. But um, one is uh, the nature of scripture, I think. No, science, morality, and then the true gospel. Those are the, the three areas where I get the most amount of questions. And then there are other secondary levels there as well, uh, secondary topics as well. Yeah. Okay. But but if you can ask the right questions, then you know what the Bible teaches well that's step one and step two because ask the right questions and you will uncover the internal inconsistency that's that's all i'm saying if you want to call that transcendental principle that's well, fine it's and it's and it's a principle and it's actually part of the argument when we formalize it so like that's it's correct no, that's correct yes right. it so is they're, they're there but what I'm, I, so the, just it's just the way that i view this particular school of apologetics which i think is the right one i think is the most biblical mm -hmm. i just view it broader than yeah. What and and look, it could be possible that I was misunderstanding every single person who articulated something like this. That that's mm -hmm. very possible, but it seemed to me like there were many people who were advocating for a form of apologetic that only addresses those big T transcendentals, those those yeah. immaterial principles that yes, absolutely presuppose God, and I'm perfectly fine using them. But what I'm saying is, when you address logic. When you address morality, when you address the preconditions for science, mm -hmm. you are you are using tag proper, tag as such, which is a form of presuppositional argumentation. That's and I I think that our terms just don't line up. But would you pretty yeah. much agree with everything? I, I'll just say this: If I was standing behind you and saw you use your three points. I would, you'd see me with like cheerleading pom poms. I'd be like, oh, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, Joel, yeah. Joel, Joel, hey, hey, he's going to help us win today. I'll have like a whole cheering <laughs> thing for you because everything you're saying is whether you don't see the connection or not, or maybe, maybe you kind of like, oh, maybe it doesn't make a little sense, or eh, I still think it's a little different. The way you're saying it is precisely how I would say, go for it. Great. Um, and that's not the difference. What you're saying is not the difference between, say, Bonson and Frame. Uh, there, the, the differences between Bonson and Frame are on a different level. Um, sure, but I would agree with you actually. Um, John Frame is a better articulator of the method, even though there's some differences in Frame than Van Til. Now, is he a better articulator than Bonson? Eh, I'm not so sure, but I love John Frame, and I highly recommend people check out his books. And I have a bunch of them here. Um, me too. I'd be surprised what's in my library. I'm actually a big fan of Gordon Clark, even though I'm not a Clarkian. People are going to throw something at the screen. Okay. I was a Clarkian for a short while. Hmm. Uh, I think most presuppositionalists who are kind of 
introduced, they'll be like, oh yeah, Clarkian. And then they find like a Bonson debate or a Vance lecture or a book, and then they switch over. But yeah, um, there are not many Clarkians running around today. Um, but Joel, I encourage you, man, keep doing what you're doing, despite kind of the, maybe a semantical difference that we're having here or whatever. I think what you're doing is excellent. I've seen, um, and I highly recommend people who are listening. I've seen Joel debate. He does an excellent job arguing presuppositionally. And I, and I would say transcendentally, yeah, well, um, you and, would I say think, that. and I think he does it very effectively. So regardless of kind of the disagreements over the language and things like that, um, he is an excellent apologist and I really do think you guys should support what he's doing. So I highly recommend you guys go over Please there to the, the think Institute and the podcast, um, worldview legacy, worldview legacy, which is on iTunes, right? It's on just about everything. So okay. wherever people, if, if you're on YouTube right now, you can get it on YouTube. If you're listening later on, on your favorite podcast app, right. it's probably on that app as well. Right. Yeah, so now, legacy. so my final words for you, Joel and which is an, which is a positive, what you're doing in your three-step approach is one, Vantillion, but the way you express it, you're doing something that many Vantillians don't do, is you are using more simplified language to argue those points. And that's, in my opinion, that's what we need. We can't stay in our ivory towers talking about transcendental categories and transcendental arguments and transcendental principles when there are people going to hell and need to hear the gospel. And I think the way you communicate and teach, it has a beautiful simplicity to it that an average person can be like, yeah, I can do that. That makes sense once you lay it out. So I think you're an excellent teacher. I think you are very good at um, bringing things down to the lower shelf without, without actually diluting uh, what you're trying to say. And I, I want to encourage you in that. I, hey, I appreciate that big time, especially coming from you. And I'm going to blow some more smoke your way because um, I I have learned, I've called you before some of these debates that I've done mm -hmm. and been like, Eli, help me, help me remember this. How do I articulate this again? And you have walked me through the process. And uh, so I've learned a ton from you, brother. And you know what else? I know we're going to get to questions here and I'm, I'm fine on time, but um the last time I was on your show, I think it was last year, maybe last summer, but we talked mm -hmm. about pre-sup for the kiddos. Yeah. And I have to tell you, I don't know if I've ever told you this, that prepping for that discussion set me on a course that would eventually mm. actually very helpfully define the direction of the Think Institute mm. because we started focusing more on families and on, especially with fathers leading their families in articulating and being able to answer the questions about the biblical worldview. And that, okay. that, you know, there were several impetuses for that, but one of the major hinges was, or whatever launch points was uh, coming on your show. So that conversation yeah. was really, really good. I don't know what your audience thought of it, but I, I loved it. I, I thought it was great. And I thought it was a topic that needed to be done. One of the questions that I get more than any question is, um, when are you coming out with a, a presuppositional apologetics workbook for teenagers or like young people? And I'm just you like, I that? don't have, I don't have time. I wish I could. So Bro. if someone wants to write it, I totally would buy it and promote it. Uh, can but, I, uh, oh, yeah. can I jump in here and make a quick plug? Because sure. this, you're, you're, you're setting me up. I gotta, I gotta knock this out of the park. <laughs> okay. I, I am almost done with my apologetics curriculum for eighth through 12th graders. Nice. I've okay. been teaching it at the homeschool co-op where I've been teaching for the last year. And um, if, if I dare say that, say this, the students have loved it. I mean, I've never gotten such positive feedback. I think on any work in ministry that I've done uh, more so than this using this curriculum. So that's going to be coming out Lord willing very, very soon. I'm talking with a publisher. Um, I haven't quite decided fully on the route that we're going to go yet, but mm. It's very, very close. It's like 27 lessons, 28 lessons, um, laying out the method in very simple terms that an eighth grader can understand and apply and get excited about, and then going through several different objections that people are going to hear on the street or, or from their classmates. Well, so, keep me updated, yeah, it's coming. I'll have you back on, uh, and we can talk about the book, and, and uh, that'll be a blessing, I'm sure. Uh, speaking of middle, uh, middle school, I actually teach sixth grade Bible and eighth grade logic, and of course, I do it from a very apologetic bent. Um, and I have this Bible box my wife had has made out of a shoe box 
Bible questions. And so the thing is filled to the brim and they're all anonymous. I figured, you know, what would be great to do as an episode is to go through some of these questions so that people can see what sixth graders and eighth graders ask about the Bible and theology. So I might just do it blind. I might bring the box, take out the thing and just read the question and kind of interact so people can see what kind of questions are young people asking? And maybe there's some kind of precept application to how those questions could be answered. So um, stay tuned for that. I'll do that in the near future. I'm sure that'll be a lot of fun. But let's right. move to the questions real quick. And uh, we'll take a few. I can't stay up too much longer, but uh, I'd like to thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. So let's see here. I'm only going to go to the ones that have emphasized that it, it is a question that they have. Do, 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 do. Let's see here. I don't do a very, uh, um, I'm not very tech savvy. So I have to like literally just scroll down until I see something. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Uh, no, that's a statement. Okay. I don't see questions. Let's see. I know. There were, oh, here we go. Okay. So Sid, thank you so much for your question. Sid is asking, Joel, what are your thoughts on reformed scholastics since they are a divination from precept, more classical? I don't know what they mean by divination, but. D uh, that can't be. That's got to be uh, der maybe derivation. Oh, yes. Maybe. Um, yeah, divination sounds like you're conjuring up. Uh... <laughs> like, come on, Sid. Are you a pagan? We need to pray for you, everyone. <laughs> we don't do. We I want don't do... you to. I want you to call the number on the bottom of the screen, Sid. All right, and screen. we will send you two <laughs> bottles of anointing oil that you will rub. And oh, no, I'm just kidding. Yes. Go ahead. If you want, if you understand the question, you can go for it. There. I, I have. I. I would be guessing. I would absolutely okay. be guessing. The Reform Scholastics. I mean. I I'm familiar with that term. I'm, I'm familiar with the, the tradition of scholasticism that came out of the reformation. Um, I do not know what they said about uh, apologetics. I mean, now my mind is sort of cycling through the different things that I've learned about deviating. I mean, maybe they're a deviation from deviation. Precept. Right. So, so maybe, yeah, I would say that the reform scholastic scholastics were not precept in any formal way. You do see hints of precept throughout church history, but I think Van Til really was the first to mm -hmm. like latch onto these principles and say, wait a minute, there's a lot of good stuff throughout church history, but they've gone wrong here and see, this is where we can do it more consistently with, with scripture. So um, if, if that's the question they're asking, yeah, I think, my thoughts, at least, I'd be critical of the reform scholastics in as much as they they allow for autonomy and neutral yes. categories to sneak into their methodology. Yeah, and and Ventil addresses it's not the reform scholastics, but he addresses that way of doing apologetics, which was very common in his day and in the previous mm -hmm. century, um, in his book uh, Christian Theistic Evidences, which I'm only about halfway through. But man, okay. he just he just. Uh, Excori he just lays into is it Butler? Who's the guy that he just lays into? It's Butler, yeah, yeah. He's the evidentialist and, guy. Yes, yep. and you know that way of thinking was so common back then, as it is today, because we love autonomy. We human beings think that we are autonomous. That's the, that's our default, mm -hmm. and we're not. And so, um, yeah, insofar that the reform scholastics um, strayed in that direction. Uh, I would, I would be against it. I will say I did write an, the other one of my capstone papers on Jonathan Edwards and Jonathan Edwards had, uh, he, his approach to apologetics was really, uh, I mean, it wasn't reform. It wasn't uh, Vantillian necessarily, but, uh, you can tell there there's, there's maybe some shadows of Vantill in uh, in jonathan edwards there, there are elements of presuppositionalism in a lot of uh, i when i had doug wilson on a while back he i loved what he said about uh, c.s lewis who he, he said well c.s lewis is not typically understood as a presuppositionalist but you can see seeds of it in his thought he says when atheists were behaving c.s lewis is more evidential but when the atheists were misbehaving he was very presuppositional. You can't even make sense out of morality. Right. And this, the, so uh, it really depends. You know, um, you can see seeds of it, definitely. Um, yeah. All right, let's move on to another question here. Thanks, Sid. Uh, Sean, uh, so is a reductio argument enough to give justified true belief, in particular, the justified part of justified true belief? Um, I'll, I want to hear your thoughts on that, Joel, but I'll answer it since it's addressed to me. Uh, a reductio argument is just seeking to show 
the absurdity of a person's assertion. So it's not meant to provide a justification of knowledge. Um, it's just trying to show that given what the unbeliever is saying or the other person saying, they've refuted themselves. Their position's reduced to absurdity. So I, I think you, your, your question, uh, I, I mean this respectfully, your question doesn't make sense in that a reductio argument is not trying to be enough to provide justified true belief. It's trying to show that a belief is actually false because it's absurd. Is that how you understand it, uh, Joel? Yeah, a hundred percent. When I first read it, I'm like, "Oh, is that is that what a reductio is supposed to do?" But um, yeah, if you think, and I, I very rarely will talk about a justified true belief. I tend to kind of follow Alvin Plantinga and talk about warrant rather than justification. And so, um, you know, if you think about what what gives a belief warrant, you think about uh, well, you've you've got to have properly functioning truth seeking faculties. You know, your your mind is working. Your your eyes are not deceiving you. Your ears are not deceiving you. You've got truth seeking faculties that are working properly, and you're functioning in a propitious environment, an advantageous environment for truth seeking. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, I'm I'm not a, a planting in uh, a reformed epistemologist. Plantingian. Plantingian. <laughs> um, Come on, bro, get it right. No, yeah. just <laughs> well, it shows you how much I interact with planting. Yeah, but um. It. But the uh, what we're doing with if if you take the reductio and then you add in as I describe it as the internal critique of the um, or the positive case for Christianity that's fine then um, what what you're doing is you're showing them that it's that you that his belief he doesn't have the warrant for his belief I think or he doesn't have the justification and that by making the positive case for Christianity that could the Christian position is warranted. As a matter of fact, you can't even make sense out of the argument without the Christian belief being true. Yeah. I, whatever. I'm fine with that. <laughs> like, bro, I know that. Look, don't this is the eyebrow, Eli. I know what I'm, I'm saying. I know what I'm talking. I'm not anti precept or anti. I'm just kidding. I'm just trying to bring purpose. Purpose. it down. <laughs> I'm not anti that. Uh, okay, so uh, real quick, if you guys haven't, sub if there are people listening to this and haven't subscribed to Revealed Apologetics, you need to click the subscribe the subscribe button. That helps me out a lot. Um, a lot of these episodes go straight on iTunes as well, so it's super helpful if you do a nice review, a sentence or two, like "Hey, this show is really awesome," or "Hey, this show is really terrible." Whatever you want to put, uh, it is helpful. So um, I would appreciate it if you guys could do any of those uh, two things. Also, if you could head over to Joel's channel as well to think. Institute and the podcast. What was the podcast one more time? Worldview Legacy. Worldview yes. Legacy. All right, Joel, here's a curveball for you. A uh, question. How do you defend our worldview against a deist that doesn't necessarily disagree with the Christian worldview, but he likes to believe in a God he created in his mind based on what he sees in nature? Mm. Go ahead. Refute deism. <laughs> <laughs> in two All seconds. right. So I, I like the founding fathers, but I would uh, take take issue with many of them here. Um, okay. So the first question that I would have is, uh, so you made up this, this deist God, why, who, 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 who gives you the authority to just decide what God is like? Did you get that from somewhere? Was it revealed to you? Is it, is it your, um, is it what you've ascertained through looking at science? The world seems like a clock that's been wound up and then abandoned. And if so, I would say, well, that's not, you know, that's not uh, what I see when I look at nature. So who's to who's to arbitrate between the two of us? In other words, who gives you the right to come up with your own religion? And um, and, you know, unless unless this guy is claiming to be a prophet from this deist God or something like that, which I think we could pretty easily refute. Scripture gives us categories or um, criteria for what makes a, a true prophet. Um, uh, you know, you just say, well, who gave you the right to come up with your own religion? Now, if he's advocating for some sort of like actual, like, um, uh, what would you call it? Like a monistic or a, um, a Unitarian monotheism or something like that, you know, where it's like, uh, well, it's not the triune God of scripture. That's where you might need to get a little more technical. I'm actually, I've been thinking a lot lately. Um, I haven't been working on it explicitly lately, but sort of on the back burner. Uh, and that is an argument um, from logic that shows why logic requires a specifically triune God, as you say, Eli, the triune God of scripture, logic itself requires. And I've, I've made this argument before in different like AMAs that I've done, but, um, but again, now if we're going to, if we're going to get into the weeds, this is where I would get very transcendental as I'm defining it and say, look, logic itself requires the specific triune God of scripture. Um, 
if you're just going to start with sort of some sort of bare deism, I would say, what's your authority for coming up with that religion? And, and then, and then, and then all I can say is, look, you've come up with your own re religion on the very same, on the same level of authority that you've come up with that. I reject it out of hand by fiat. I reject your God. What are you going to do now? What are you going to say? No, you can't on whose authority you came up with it out of whole cloth. I reject it period. Mm -hmm. So uh, thankfully the Christian worldview, then I would go into the Christian worldview and say, well, the Christian worldview is based on, uh, it's not just based on my own op opinion and precious feelings. It's based on the, the revelation of God. And we could get into how the revelation of God is self-authenticating and how you need it to make sense of anything else. Yeah. It's a question says, how do you defend our worldview against a deist that doesn't necessarily disagree with the Christian worldview? He does. Oh, that's right. Oh, he, yeah. does, he does disagree with the Christian <laughs> worldview. Right. Yeah. And you need to point out that yeah. he's like, I don't really disagree with it, but, and then his butt is going to lay out everything that is actually in conflict with the Christian that's worldview right. system. Yeah. Right. Sometimes I don't agree with the Christian worldview, but I want to believe this other thing. And this other thing that they say they want to believe in is actually in conflict with the Christian worldview system. That's right. So you got to show right. that he's actually not, he, he actually is disagreeing. You want to, as Van Til told Bonson uh, in a personal correspondence once, he said that, Greg, you always need to remember to push the antithesis. Hmm. Right in this statement here, there is a blurring of the antithesis with the apparent agreement of the Christian worldview. But in reality, the very next sentence that talks about him liking to believe in a God he created in his mind based on what he sees in nature is antithetical to the Christian worldview system. And so you want to push yeah. that disagreement so that person cannot have a safe space, so to speak, in thinking that there is this general agreement. So let's move on from there. There isn't an agreement that's and right. you need to press that fact. Um, yeah. That's how I would address that that's as well as what Joel said as well. By, by, by what authority? Um, I don't know if he was doing it on purpose to stay away from the popular phraseology, but one might say, um, by what standard? By what standard? Uh, that's still a fair. That's still a fair phrase to use. I, I still use it there too. So, I'm just messing around. Um, all right. Here's a comment from the Urban Reformed Apologist. Uh, this is uh, Ricky Roldan from the Reformed Presuppositional Apologetics Facebook group. He mm -hmm. says, "Comment for Joel. Keep working on making it easier, brother. What you are doing is so it's much needed. You are making tag much easier to understand. I would agree with that, even despite our kind of." disagreement yeah. on what that looks like. I still think you're doing an excellent job um, uh, simplifying it for folks, the everyday person. And that's what we really want to do. Praise God. Um, and one of the things Thanks, I appreciate Ricky. about a lot of the well-known presuppositionalists is that they're also churchmen. Bonson mm -hmm. was a pastor. Van Til also uh, was pastored for a while. Um, this stuff needs to be brought to the average believer yeah. so that we can bring it to the average person. Um, we can't just always stay on the internet debating about it. So I think that's an important thing. Yeah. Um, Peter W says, how do you respond to the problem of evil argument? That sounds like it might be addressed towards you. I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, I have, I have some thoughts, but I, you're my guest. Sure. I give okay. you dibs. Unless, unless you want me to give my, my <clears throat> thoughts and you share afterwards, that's fine as well. No, I'm, 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 I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy to address it. So this is where I'm going to, I draw heavily on John frame. And, uh, the, f the first thing you have to do is let's reduce this down the problem of evil. What is evil exactly? What what sta what ultimate standard of good is evil negating or is evil the absence of? And that's going to that's going to expose the vacuity or uh, emptiness of You got to be careful with this argument. Let me just back up a second. If someone is asking why their grandma just died, man, put your arm around him and tell him, tell him you love him and, and that you're praying for him. And, uh, can I tell you about the hope I have in Jesus? You know, can I, can I, can I walk with you through this and can I share with you how God has been with me when my son got cancer, when my wife got cancer, when my son, other son got mercy, when my son needed a heart transplant, can I, can I walk with you through this? And, and I'm going to share how G, how Jesus comforted me and how Jesus has given me hope through the darkest times in my life. Can we do that? Cause that's, that's a legit answer. If someone is really asking this from a deep place of existential dread. Okay. But if we're just, if we're just talking philosophical, how could a good God allow evil? Okay. Well, we're going to have to define evil and evil is meaningless 
apart from an absolute, universal, immaterial, knowable standard of goodness. It has to be a knowable standard. It can't just be one that uh, is out there somewhere that's inaccessible to us. It has to be one that we can that we all have access to. And that is the kind of standard that you can't get, I believe, from any system apart from Christianity. Now, again, if someone posits some other system, then we'll have to deal with that particular system and the flaws in it by asking good questions. Okay, right. But now let's make the positive case from Christianity. Let's let's submit Christianity to an internal critique. And this is where I draw on John Frame yeah. and Greg Bonson. Yes, right. I, I'm eclectic too. I like to bring uh, I like to bring the different um, soldiers together to form yeah, one army. I love Frame. Yeah. Oh well, no, I know, I know. But you yeah. know, those two weren't didn't agree on everything. Sure. But um, okay, so on the one hand, you've got Romans nine twenty. Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Shall the clay say to the potter, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some vessels for noble use and some nobles for ignoble use or whatever the word is? Um, you know what John Frame calls this? He calls it the shut up defense. And I love that. He, because it's, it's like, uh, I think Doug Wilson says, shut up, he explained. You know, uh, <laughs> Um, so, and I think frame says it that way as well, but that's good because it, it puts things in perspective. Look, who are you? Are you God? Do you have any, God could explain this to you and your head would explode. Your little pea brain would break. If God tried to explain to you, uh, the reason here, you're clay, he's potter. You don't question God. That's one question. Uh, the, the second perspective on it is this, it's uh, Romans eight, 28 through 39, which says that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God uses evil for good. Genesis 50, 20, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. That's right. Not, not God used for good. God meant it for good. It's the mm -hmm. same verb. It, God is, God is the perfect author so that um, he gives his, the characters in his story, the ability to do evil. And it turns out that God intended that for a good outcome all along. Right. The, the gospel is the ultimate example of that. The worst thing that ever happened is the innocent son of God was crucified like a murderer and bled and was tortured mercilessly. And that turned out to be the greatest thing that ever happened because that's how Jesus saved the world. Right. So uh, we, we can deal with the, we, we call this the greater good defense. Yeah. God uses evil for, for greater good. And then the third one is, um, God is with you in your suffering. Now, this is a special promise for believers, those who have been born again, those who are um, regenerated and, and, and given the Holy Spirit from God. And uh, this is where I can get very personal and I can talk about the things that I just alluded to where God has been with me in my life. And, and this is where I would make, uh, this is a very easy transition to saying, you know what? There's sin in the world Um they're suffering in the world. That's it. We live in a world that it's the exact way that the Bible describes it. There's a lot of suffering and that suffering is ultimately due to sin. And, and you know what? We have the remedy for sin. You want to know what it is? 2000 years ago, a man named Jesus Christ died for the sins of people like you and me. Would you like to know him? Would you like to know the eternal life and the peace that he offers you right now? It's a very, it's a, just a natural transition to go into a gospel invitation. Mm. So that's how I answer it. It's a little long winded. I probably, yeah. if I didn't have that much time on the street, I wouldn't say all that, but uh, no worries. No, that was excellent. And we also need to just from a logical perspective, there's not just one problem of, uh, there is not one problem of evil argument. There are multiple problem right. of evil arguments. Um, there are a couple of things you could say. There is no problem of evil given Christian theism because on Christian right. theism, right? Someone says, you know, Christian theism has a problem of evil. That's an external critique, not an internal one yeah. in which you hypothetically grant the truth of the Christian worldview and then try to show that evil is a problem given the truth of Christianity. Now, given the truth of the Christian worldview, there is no problem of evil. God has morally sufficient reasons for the evil that he allows. That's it. From a That's logical right. perspective, that might not be satisfying to someone, but the very fact that it's even remotely possible, uh, it follows that there's no logical contradiction. So we want to make a distinction between logical problems of evil, which tries to show that there is a logical incoherency between the existence of the Christian God and evil, um, and emotional arguments, which have no bearing on the truth or falsity of a position, but um, they're kind of just showing, you know, like, this is a huge emotional problem. How do you surmount this? Well, from a Christian perspective, it really doesn't matter uh, how one might go about doing that. It's irrelevant to the truth of Christian theism. 
Um, so again, any number of ways to respond to that, um, that argument. I think Joel did a good job there. Uh, let's see, we'll take a few more and then we will, uh, we'll end the stream here. Do, 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 do. I don't know if I skipped in. Eli, have you had a conversation with a reformed Thomist on apologetics? That's a random question. And have you noticed that they argue from neutrality yet deny it because most of them adhere to the Westminster Confession of Faith? I have. How do you break through that barrier? Joel can answer too. It was a deviation, not divination. Sorry, must repent. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I have not had a specific conversation with a reformed Thomist. All I would say, here, here's the thing. When Van Til accused classical apologists of the Reformed flavor of allowing for autonomy and neutrality in their apologetic methodology, he was not saying that these people knowingly did so. You had people who were Reformed, who wanted to be consistent, who sought to be consistent, but did not. Somewhere in their methodology, Van Til says, a skunk has snuck into your house and so in his writings, he tried to point out, hey, you're doing great work, but there's this thing that you're allowing into your method, i.e. autonomy and neutrality that you need to expel, right? So there are many reformed Thomists who will say, hey, I affirm the Westminster Confession of Faith and look, at, I can do apologetics the way that I'm doing and I don't believe in neutrality. I don't believe in autonomy. Then we, ne we need to just say like Bonson said, right? Name that tune. Let me hear you defend the faith uh, and we can examine whether or not their methodology allows for these categories that we think are very inconsistent with the Westminster Confession of Faith and with a presuppositional approach. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, whether it's consistent with scriptural principles, most importantly. Um, so how do you break that barrier is loving, gentle, patient conversation, not having a faction mind, especially mm -hmm. between Christians over these, like how to defend the faith. Why are we like screaming at each other? Like, why can't we just be like, dude, I kind of disagree. Like, let's kind of brainstorm and talk about it. We can't do that. The internet, people don't know how to do that. Yeah. Um, you need to step away from that mindset and just learn to have a conversation and be okay that by the end of the conversation, the reform Thomas says, no, nah, I still disagree with you. I'll be like, well, Lord be with you. May he bless both of our attempts to do what he's called us to do. And we stick by our convictions. They stick by their convictions and we both will be held accountable before God. Why do we need to drag debates out on Facebook pages and, you know, uh, insult people and things like that? It is beyond me, but there you go. Those are my thoughts. I vented a little, so I apologize. But what do you think there, uh, Joel? No, it's good. I, um, I, w w okay, I, I have something to say real quick, but I need a point of clarification. Yeah. W would a classical foundationalist, would, how, what's his relationship to a reformed Thomist? Would I, it, don't know. I don't know. I just I don't know either. that in Thomism, there are some cad, there are some different understandings between the relationship between faith and reason. Yeah. Um, and that's related to the role of natural theology and all these other things. So there right. is definitely a, a relation there, but it okay. really depends who you're talking to. So, yeah. Okay. 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 So, so I'll, I'll put that aside. I, mm -hmm. All I'll say is I interviewed uh, Jeffrey Johnson, who is the president of Grace Bible Theological Seminary. Yeah. I've had him on the uh, show before. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, you know, he was, uh, he, he did a really good job. He wrote that book, the failure of our, uh, natural theology, the failure of natural theology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, he really lays into Aquinas and, um, his over-reliance on Aristotle and really, he, I mean, he, he thinks Jeff Johnson, I think thinks any reliance on Aristotle at all is over-reliance on Aristotle. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, I was I was very convinced. I was probably convinced before him, but I think Jeff Johnson does a really good job in his book and in the various podcasts. You know, someone could listen to your episode, someone could listen to my episode of Worldview Legacy. But uh, yeah, I think Jeff Johnson does a great job. I I'm I am I am just not a fan of Thomas Aquinas. I can recognize his absolute brilliance. I really can. <laughs> He, the guy was, the guy was in Thomas school. Aquinas on the back of the trip. Not a the, fan. <laughs> <laughs> great teacher. Okay. Uh, I had John D. Woodbridge for my church history professor at Trinity at Ted's. And he made this great remark. He, he said something about how Aquinas used to write five books at once as he was walking along. He would, you know, to each different scribe, he would, he would uh, start and stop his books as, as he was, as he was walking along. And, Dr. Woodbridge said something along the lines of, can you imagine what Aquinas could have done if he was actually devoted to like actual biblical exegesis and teaching? Like, can you just imagine 
what God could have done with that mind. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the fact is he wasn't, he was over-reliant on classical Aristotelian philosophy. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I think that was his downfall. You're right. He assumed neutrality. Mm -hmm. He had a very, very limited and unbiblical view of the noetic effects of sin and the effects of sin on, uh, you know, our ability to think and reason. And look, Aristotle had some great things to say, I think. I mean, I like his, what he said about logic, but it's not a good basis for apologetic. Yeah. And, and, um, Thomas Aquinas, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I'm not a huge fan, but I mean, there's definitely golden nuggets to learn from even just the quality of his life. I mean, I love reading biographies of, you know, various thinkers and stuff. And for that reason, there's a lot to benefit and even some yeah. of their intellectual observations. I mean, he was a genius, sure. um, but, but at the base, there are some fundamental disagreements that I think are important for Christians to, um, to keep in mind. We're going to take wait, one more question here. Sorry, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Can I just tell me one more thing about that? Absolutely. If you have to remember that Aquinas was writing at a time when 99.9% of the people were some sort of Christian theist, yeah. right? So if you look at it from that perspective, and I think Dr. Woodbridge pointed this out as well in, in that class, uh, this is like 10 years ago, but um, if you if you think about it in terms of like, okay, we all already accept Christian theism. Uh, based on that foundation, are there good, like, like, can we make observations about the world and and sort of like confirm and corroborate our already pre-existing belief? I say, yes, Absolutely. As a Christian, I already believe that evidence is a meaningful category and a possible thing. So what evidence you got for me, Aquinas? And and now we can look at his five ways and mm-hmm. we and we can say, all right, yeah, there's you're right, there's some golden nuggets there because I'm already a Christian. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, there's one more question here, and then we're gonna wrap things up here. Uh Richard Cox, thank you for your question. Uh Richard asks, in Bonson's debate with Sproul, just in case people don't know, Greg Bonson debated RC Sproul. I mean, that's News, not news to me and anyone who listens to the channel, but if you're if, if you're a RC Sproul fan, you're like, wait, what? They actually debated over the topic apologetic methodology, and it uh, can be found on YouTube, um, and it's an excellent debate, an excellent debate. You see the intellectual prowess of both uh, Dr. Bonson and uh, RC, and it was a, a wonderful brotherly uh, debate. And intellectually rigorous as well. So folks want to check that out. But in Bonson's debate with Sproul, it seems like Bonson said he did not believe in mediated revelation, only unmediated. Any thoughts on this? Are you familiar with the debate yourself, uh, Joel? I know that I've started listening to it. I've never finished it. I can't speak to this question. Oh, man. Okay. Well, you definitely got to check it out. It's, it's really good. I do. I do. Um, I can't quote anywhere from Bonson's work, but it, to my knowledge, I don't believe that Bonson um, disagreed with mediated revelation. He may have held to both. So the knowledge of God um, is immediate. It is innate, right? But also there is a knowledge of God when you open your eyes, right? Open your eyes. The heavens declare the glory of God. That's immediate, right? Knowledge of God being mediated to us. But you couldn't even make sense out of that without the already immediate knowledge of God that you have. So there was a point of dispute in the debate whether Calvin was reflecting more of a immediate knowledge of God or an immediate knowledge. And Bonson was saying, you know, I think, Calvin was emphasizing the immediate and there was a, a point of dispute there. Mm-hmm. So I think he would hold to both. Um, don't quote me on that. Um, I know that's my position. Um, if you open your eyes, there's knowledge of God all around you. If you pluck your eyes out and you no longer can see, um, uh, you still know God because it is made up in your very constitution. I would agree uh, with Calvin there where you cannot even properly understand yourself without looking beyond yourself to the God in whose image you were made. So yeah, census uh, divinitatis. Yes, census that's right. God. Yeah. So, all right. Well, before we close out, uh, Joel, is there any last thing you'd like to say before uh, we close things out? No, just, well, yes. Uh, go subscribe to my podcast, Worldview Legacy, and uh, and listen to the episode with uh, Eli and my brother Parker, and then listen to all of our other episodes as well. <laughs> That's all it. right. Well, thank you. And, um, and, well- and, and, and dude, I have to say, thank you for having me on the show. We've gone, we've gone later. Uh, this was, this was almost like a last minute thing. We just talked about this a couple of days ago and, um, I really, I really, really appreciate what you do and the guests, the the caliber of guests that you have on your show. It's really excellent. And, um, and you know, like I said earlier, you've, you've helped me articulate my own apologetic and, uh, help me out with some debates. So big, big supporter of what you're doing, Eli, appreciate you, um, immensely. Well, I appreciate that, brother. Well, I'll have you back on to to take on some sixth graders and eighth graders. Uh, Love it. 
talk about doing the the Q and A thing there. So cool. All right. Well, um, that is it for this episode. Until next time, guys. Take care and God bless. Bye bye.